Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Heart and Soul Broadcasting Services. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with Dr. Nkosana Moyo, the founder of the Mandela Institute of Development Studies and an entrepreneur. If you enjoy this conversation, please remember to subscribe, to like, and to share. Enjoy this truly inspirational conversation. Dr. Nkosana Moyo, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. It's second time around, eh? I know. Because <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy talking to you because you, you challenge the way I think and you challenge the way a lot of us think. So mm-hmm. you, you are an asset to this country. Thank you for creating the time. My pleasure. My pleasure. So you've stepped down as uh, president of uh, the uh, Alliance for the People's Agenda. Why now? And what's been the thought process of uh, saying I need to quit? You know, I ask this question because when you look around, mm. founders of political parties tend to move around with them as uh, briefcases. They never let go. <laughs> what 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 has gone through your mind? And I, I need to let go now. Mm. Firstly, uh, you know the concept of the seasons of man. I mean, my at best in my in my afternoon, possibly sunset. All depends, yeah. And I think uh, APA started off with a very clear conceptual framing. And in everything we do, we want to continue to demonstrate that it was not just words. We meant what we said. I was going to be a one-term president. I'm 71 years old. So in the language of a relay, it's time for me now to pass on the baton and expect the institution to exist outside of the personalities. That's, that's what we're trying to say, what we're trying to do, what we claim we're going to do, and that's what we're demonstrating. But there is also something to be said about founders, the dreamers, staying for a certain period to nurture the dream and nurture the vision. You're comfortable that the organization is strong to to do without you? I'm comfortable that what we, we, because it never was I, so that's the starting point which is really, really important. So I I was one of the founders, not the founder. And those people are still around. So the institutional framing, the thought process was never owned by any individual. I was, the same way that people have argued that when you look at Mandela and the Rivonia trial, the words he spoke, although he said I, actually was representing a group of people. That's called institutionalization. Mm-hmm. Therefore, I'm convinced that the thought process of what motivated a, a, an upper kind of initiative will persist. And but what lessons did you learn during the journey of um, creating APA and where you are right now? about one yourself and about the politics of this country? You know, I suppose there are many, there are many, many lessons. I think one of them is that when you, when you uh, are part of a founding group, you live, breathe, dream literally the ideas that you're cooking up. After a certain point, it becomes to you like, this is obvious, this is not rocket science. But I think it, it can lead to mistakes in the sense that you need to understand when you then take it out there, the people you're talking to, the people you're engaging with are starting from ground zero. They have not gone through the same journey of literally living, dreaming, breathing this concept. And it takes much longer for them to get, to get what it is you, you're going on about. So it's a huge lesson to understand. You're starting off with people who are socialized to a particular current setup. You are coming in with a a very new way of framing things. It will take time. 
and you must condition yourself to that and accept it's a journey. It is a journey. Is it, are you, do you get the sense that the, the vision, the thinking is, is uh, catching on the new way of doing things that Apple is, is, is on about? So let's go back to the beginning. You know, we, we started up uh, very close to the last election. I mean, it was by any measure very close to the last election. You can look at the outcome in terms of number of votes as it was a very small number of votes, but actually it was a significant number of votes in the sense that at that point, that number of people already were saying, we understand this, okay? So if you then take that and say, what has happened in the country continues to reinforce the message. In many ways, in a funny kind of thinking, you could say, what has happened has been very good for APA because it forces people to keep going back and comparing what we said, what we said was likely to happen. Let's put it as likely to happen because of the circumstances where we're coming from, the personalities. And when now they contrast our message with what is actually turned out to be, it keeps reinforcing that actually the upper approach. So talk to me about the rare as brief as you can about the upper approach and what that what is that message that you say people are now sitting up and saying this is what they've been saying what is that message what is that approach again it's got a number of components to it the first one is that look at the name the name was not an accident the name was supposed to be sending a message to the ownership issue who owns the thought process of choosing leaders it should be the people but I think people tend to take a very passive approach to this. They wait for the leaders to emerge. And in our campaign, we kept telling people, when you are electing, the process of electing, you are sitting at a selection panel. All of the candidates are applicants for a job. They are literally applicants for a job. So put on a framework of people are coming to me to apply for a job. What process must I go through in order to end up choosing a leader? Firstly, I must do a diagnostic of the circumstances of my company, i.e. my country. Where is my country at the moment? Before I even look at the candidates, before I even get in, in the uh, analogy of a company, before I write the job description of who I'm looking for, I analyze the company. What is it at this point in time that I need is the characteristics of a leader because this is what my company needs at this point in time. So what does my country need at this point in time? Okay, I then frame on the basis of what where my country is. If I'm in need of writing a new constitution, it must be clear I'm going to be looking for somebody who has got an appreciation of constitution writing, law, constitution writing, blah, blah. If I, let's say I'm going through all of the other pieces are in place, but we've got whatever the reason is, an acute challenge with human rights, then in my formulation, the job description, I'm going to be looking for somebody who understands. If on the other hand, the challenge is that of managing an economy. Similarly, I then say, okay, in my job description, it must follow that I want somebody who has got some experience of how an economy works. So that's before people have even applied. Because you are saying, I'm teeing up a framework for how I'm going to look for a leader. Because I'm going to be sitting on this panel. And when I look at the CVs, I must be looking for these characteristics because my country is at this point in time. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. It does make sense. I'm, I'm, I'm looking surprised because, uh, in a way, it's also disappointed because and that's that's a powerful way of looking at things, doing a diagnosis and then saying who fits this job. My disappointment is we're so far from that. And why am I saying that? Because if, to me, your I'm I'm going to use a strong term, which is your rejection by the people, mm. Simba Kony's rejection by the people, mm. says to me, do the people understand the assignment that they ought to be giving a leader? or it's an emotional thing. And I, I fall down, uh, I come down to the conclusion that I don't think we actually understand what 
choosing leadership, our leadership is, is all about. We get excited about rallies. We get excited about people that give us T-shirts. But do we stop and say, the people that we're electing are people that we want to mm. run in government, mm. like the way you're saying, mm. like a company. So for me, to use that strong term, your rejection mm. by the people, Simbama Kone's rejection by the people says to me, what kind of leader do our people need? You know, Trevor, I hear you. But I want to try and put a bit of a more positive twist to that. I think making mistakes is human. And when you look across the world, everybody makes the mistakes. Even in terms of choosing leaders, everybody makes the mistakes. For us, the challenge is not that we make mistakes. The challenge is that there is no evidence that we learn from our mistakes. That, for me, is a bigger challenge. You know, uh, earlier on, you and I we had a chat about life's experience. Yeah. And I was telling you that in my book, there is not a single thing that has happened to me which is a negative. Because I've conditioned myself to extract lessons from it, the positives that lead me to then make more informed, better informed decisions. So when a nation or a society makes a decision which turns out to be not as good a decision as they could have made, if they then demonstrate that they are factoring that experience into the next decision they make, I think that's fine. I think that's, they are grown. They are grown. But when you make the same mistake time and time again, that's what you then have to challenge yourself to say, what is going on here? Yeah, to be also to be fair to Zimbabweans, I think we then have to look at maybe the problem is not so much that people don't see what they ought to be doing. We need to also take into account that we suspect, let's say we suspect, that the decisions people make are not the decisions that are announced as what the people have decided. Okay, so you have to factor that in that actually we have to be careful about the actions of the people and what is ultimately announced, are we confident that that reflects the mistake or good judgment that the people exercised or not? Yeah. Let's move on to, um, you, you said something which is powerful the last time that we spoke, uh, quoting Nelson Mandela, that there's always the next hill to climb. Yeah. Uh, I take it that leading up was a hill. Um, but I get the sense that you've set your sights on the Mandela Institute of Development Studies as your next hill. Talk to us about the thinking behind the Mandela Institute of Development Studies. What is it that you are? What problem are you addressing? What are you wanting to achieve and how are you going about it? Thank you. So let's look at the journey before minds was even conceptualized. What had Nkosana done? I worked in the private sector for the longest time, finance mostly. I joined the cabinet here and lasted all of 10 months. I worked in development institutions. I was in Washington at IFC. I went to CDC, then went to Actis, then went to the AFDB. And by the time I got to uh, conceptualizing minds, I looked back at all of these experiences. And I tried to understand something, and I had a problem understanding it. And my challenge was the following. Africa, at that point, had been generalizing, going to the first countries that got independence, your Ghanas of this world, and so on and so on. We were well onto our journey on the other side, to, of sort of going towards a century virtually in the sense of over 50 years, right? And I looked and I said to myself, when you look at the evidence in front of us, we are not making very much progress in bettering the conditions of our people. But when I look at how I interact, where the people I interact with, my experiences, there isn't a place where I go and there is a conversation which is interrogating this fact. We are not making progress. Why are we not making? Why are we not having this conversation? Yeah, We are not going to get answers or possible solutions until we ask the question. So MIND was an attempt to create a space where we, we, on our own, I must add, I, what, why do I say on our own? I'd been on a journey 
where I was a very active participant on organize, in organizations such as World Economic Forum. What occurred to me was that these were platforms put in place by somebody else for a different set of problems. It included other people's interests on what was happening on our continent. It definitely was not driven by us to try and find answers to our own challenges on our continent. So I said, why don't we set about creating a platform where we as Africans, Africans broadly defined, have a space where we can go and have this conversation and be as honest as we can, i.e., ladies and gentlemen, we've got a problem. We've got a problem because when you look at the other parts of the world, they are making more progress in bettering the conditions of their populations than we are. What is the challenge? Why we've got easily, in most uh, instances, the highest share of natural resources than anybody else. Yeah? We, yet, we appear to be rich and poor, the rich and the poorest. How do we reconcile these two things? Let's at least have the conversation. Yeah? So that was point number one. But having said that, it, it was not enough to just form a platform where these uh, dialogues, as we call them, could take place. We then set about saying but we also need to have a set of activities that we're going to engage in ourselves and if you like, we're going to be not just a think tank, but a think tank which attempted to also do something. And we said, one activity area has got to be with the youth. It has to be an engagement with the youth because the demographic tells us that's a very important component of our population. The other activity area was based on a hypothesis. My view, right or wrongly, and that's why I call it a hypothesis, was that until Africans reconnect with the essence of being African, big debate, what does that mean? And I'm okay, I don't know, but it appeared to me that until we connect, reconnected with the essence of being African, we were trying to build an edifice on a wrong foundation. And my, my, so those who would go on the base of Ungo Sanamoyo, the name, and putting it within the, the sort of Unguni uh, uh, tribal setting, they would say to me, Ungo Sana, ufuna said go kama pech. And I would say no. And the reason why I, I refer to this is important because yeah. my answer was, no, I am not implying that we should go primitive. I'm saying let's look around the world. And let's, learn, let's try to force ourselves to understand something going on and see whether we can make sense of it. If you go to Japan today, you find a modern state. But that modern state has got some characteristics or idiosyncratic underpinnings which are Japanese. It's a modern state, but it's also Japanese. What does that mean? You go to Germany, you find another modern state, but it's not Japanese. You go to France, yeah. you find yet another modern state. It's not German and it's not Japanese. And I said, to, in answer to this, Ufuna said, go yeah. I said, that's what I'm trying to get at. There is something which we've taken out of the foundation, which you find in these other places, and which does not uh, subvert modernity. We have not understood that we need to modernize ourselves We've tried to try we try to copy somebody else as far as the foundation is concerned. And I'm saying, when I look at this, my hypothesis is that it doesn't work. It does not work. So are we with experience? I mean, I like the fact that there's there's thinking, there's talking, there's dialogues, and then there's action. Are you happy with the traction that you're seeing on the ground as a result of both? Mine is only just over ten years old. Again, we've touched on this as far as APA is concerned, is when you look at where the countries we consider developed today, where they came from, is 10 years enough to come to a conclusion about that? I would say no. No. But the seed has been sown, and I think we have to continue to build because the challenges are still with us. We cannot afford not to continue until we find an answer which says 
either we don't need to continue having this conversation anymore because the evidence says it's not necessary or until we make this work either or then we have absolute institution has been created. yes the institution is in place long after Kosana is gone I would like to think so and that's part of the reason incidentally why I didn't name it Kosana Moyo <laughs> it was Mandela and by the way I had the fortune of having lunch with President Mandela former at that point and I took him through my thinking and he said you know what I, I really be, I think this is a very good idea that's how come I asked for him face to face for me to use his name to brand the institution and they gave me the go ahead because I'm going to put you on the spot in terms of you are an inspiration to a lot of people on the continent in terms of where you have conducted yourself in business and politics. Absolutely unblemished. Um, so there is no such thing. There's no such thing. Um, as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, but I don't know. Yeah, uh, no, no, no. But I mean, whether skeletons or not, all I'm saying, there is no perfection. Sure. There is no perfection. So um, the question is, how does Gosana lead himself? How do you lead yourself? Because you can't lead others if you can't lead yourself. And I'm, I'm, I'm wanting you to help the young people out there in terms of how, with the success that you've had, what 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 are you The success that people think I've had, okay? <laughs> I think I've yeah. missed you had. Yeah. What are your leadership principles? What are your leadership habits? How do you lead yourself? Mm. You know, you've asked, you framed it in terms of leadership. In fact, you've asked many questions in one. So let me let me answer you indirectly, but we can expand on this conversation. So when I meet young people, which I do quite often, they ask a similar question, but the way they tend to frame it is, Dr. Moyo, we think that you've led a very successful career, working career, whatever. What, how would you advise us to manage our careers? And my answer over a long period has always been the same. My answer has always been that when I look at how young people seem to be fixated and almost absorbed by worrying about the next job and promotion, I think they're making a mistake. And I always say to them, your best recommendation comes from the job you're doing now, not from what you dream you're going to do tomorrow. And in many ways, it goes back to election issues, track record issues, and so on and so on. You know, if I come to your, to your company, Trevor, as a customer or whatever, the service provider, my interactions with your people ultimately is what's going to make me open opportunities for those I interact with. It's not based on what they tell me. It's based on how I experience them doing their work now. Now, not what they promise they're going to do tomorrow. Everything I think in life is actually based on how people experience you at this time. How you are executing your responsibilities now. If you do that and do it well, the opportunities will open up. That's my philosophy. Don't worry too much about what's going to, am I going to be promoted? Do the job you've been given today and excel at it. Do it as well as you can. But we find the, I think that's important because invariably, oh, perhaps invariably is a strong word, the, the failure to give maximum attention to the assignment that you've got. Because the assignment you've got right now is going to determine the doors that open. Absolutely. The, the tendency is to be part timing and to be temporary. Then worrying about, yeah. yeah. Therefore, you, you then, fail to make the mark because you have missed an opportunity Absolutely. of excelling where you are Absolutely. now. My, 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 what I say to young people is, uh, because, I'm, uh, because of my Christian belief is, do everything as unto God. You, the boss doesn't have to be there mm. to mm. please the boss. Be happy with what you're doing. Be satisfied with what you're doing. But much more importantly, give what you're doing yeah, I, I think we, we're finding different language to say exactly the same thing, yeah? And you see, the other thing that's related to this is that when I fly either in or out of Zimbabwe, depending on who is around at the airport, because of the things I've done, people will say, president, chef, what, what, what. And I always say to them, you know what, 
ladies and I appreciate this. But you know what? My dream, my wish would be that every Zimbabwean would be treated the same. Because if you treat every Zimbabwean the same, it means those who consider important will get good treatment anyway. They would automatically be included. So why don't you stop focusing on who you consider to be important and challenge yourself to deliver the best service to every Zimbabwean? Once you do that, the rest is done. But if you isolate those you think are important and leave everybody else behind, your job is not done as well as it could have been done. I, I, I agree. And, and it, again, we had this conversation on, on, um, before we came here quite a, a while back, which is if we all gave our best every day, this society would be a different society. Absolutely. But are we giving our best every day or we hold back uh, based on a number of variables? But if we applied ourselves, today I'm going to get up, I work at a, at a shop uh, to provide a service. I'm going to provide a service with a smile, with a friend who smile. I've got to be courteous. I'm going to do the best that I can without holding back. But we don't do that. And hence where we are, right? Now. Yeah. Again, Trevor, it's a complex conversation. It's complex because uh, if I may characterize our current society, I would argue that for whatever reason, those who are supposed to be leading us and showing us by example how we ought to behave, more often than not, they are creating hurdles in the daily lives of ordinary Zimbabweans. So what then ordinary Zimbabweans are confronted with is before they attend to what is critical, they're having to navigate their way around the hurdles. It saps the energy of most people, or we are most human beings. So, and another way of putting this is that if our leaders understood that it's not important to do things for us, it's important to create an environment within which we can do things for ourselves. But by creating that environment, it leaves us to then focus on what, rather than negotiating all these hurdles, those have been removed. What do I mean? Just illustratively, if the infrastructure was working, if I had Zesa, I have more clean water, uh, I have roads that are easily, uh, where I can easily travel, even just at a family level, the health of my, of my family, which is my responsibility, immediately, makes, it makes a difference because I don't have to worry about whether the sanitation of the water is appropriate or not. So my, my, my efforts are now going to impact on the things I am really responsible for. Yeah. So whilst I hear you that maybe we as a people have gotten to a point where we are not doing our best every day, I think I would say there is a mitigating factor. I don't think those who are supposed to facilitate by creating the appropriate environment are doing that. If you ask why is that not happening, I cannot answer because I don't get it. I don't get it because similar to this, I've told you I've just come back from, uh, from Ethiopia. A couple of things struck me. So, I, I, I mean, I traveled to East Africa a bit. I've been to Rwanda. I've been to, to Ethiopia. So let me start with Rwanda. We've got a number of students under the Minds Scholarship Program who study in Kigali. When they graduate, I always go and spend some time with them and listen to their stories. And one of the things they'll say is that when you land in Kigali, it suddenly strikes you that it is possible. It can be done. It can be done. These are young people. And a part of the reason why we deliberately send them all over the continent is precisely to give them that exposure. Suddenly, they believe in themselves. They say, if it can be done here, I can do it too. You understand? So I go to Addis Ababa. And what do I experience? I experience, firstly, an amazingly, I think efficient airline. But what was fascinating for me was that it was not just the... So Ethiopia has put a lot of resources into the airline. They now, their fleet is now about 145 uh, aircraft, huge. And a lot of them, maybe about half of them, the modern, you know, the A350 and the Airbus, no, and the Boeing 787, yeah? The, the Dreamliner. Yeah. But what, for me, what struck me, they've made this investment 
but they've made sure that in order to extract value from this investment, all of the associated facilitative services are also sufficiently expanded to make this work. The airport is not like your Dubai, not Dubai, but, but in the sense they've paid attention to the size of the airport to be able to accommodate this fleet of aircraft. The service provision in terms of visa processing and immigration control and so on and so on, they have correct sized everything to make sure that, that investing in this size fleet makes sense. The airport can handle it. Their people are trained to be able to deal with the, the, the volumes of passengers coming in. That is an investment. We are expanding an airport. At the moment, we've got a no airline uh, operational. When you go through the airport, your experience of how you are handled tells you there is no streamlining in thought process are made to make sure that this investment is making sense. So these are challenges which I, 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 I observe. You do a diagnosis yeah. and you try to understand, but why are we? Imagine getting free access to the Newsday, the Standard, the Zimbabwe Independent and the Weekly Digest for a full month. Well, you can, and all you need to do is download the Newsday e-reader app on Google Play Store or scan the Newsday QR code in any of the AMH print publications and start enjoying the quality content. e-paper. So, Bosani, you, you were outlining to us uh, the two legs of minds, which is the dialogues and then the action. What other programs does uh, um, minds offer to young people? You spoke about scholarships. Do you want to go into more detail? Not only that, so the thing within the so I said one of the key elements for minds was to engage with the youth. Yeah. Also, the, our demographics of the continent tell us yeah. if you're going to be serious about trying to. Envision, envisage a future that's going to work for the continent, it has to work for the young people, because they're the majority. So in that space, we, de we devised two program areas. The first one was an, an ongoing dialogue on elections and government us. When elections and government, the quality of governance is in fact a derivative from the quality of the elections. And the elections are another scale. The young people if, are the majority. So if they pull their, put their act together, they will influence the quality of every single African election. And the out of the quality of African elections will follow the quality of governments because the one depends on the other. So it's continuous engagement on letting them take responsibility because of their numbers. For them to apply their numbers to influence the outcomes of African elections and the quality of African elections. And therefore, the governments, if they then continue to engage in terms of accountability with the people that they've elected, they, they will be sure theoretically that the governments should improve. Chief, that's, what, that's one element of the really engagement with you. We then say to ourselves, for Africa to succeed ultimately, economic integration is a sine qua non. It, it is a must. But you know, when you look at the effort in understanding that was there during the liberation struggle of African solidarity, working to be joined up in a the continent, it's not there anymore. So it's okay. We can have conversations today about what we ought to be doing, but we said we're going to do more than that. We're going to deliberately create a lived experience for young people so that when they, they contract these problems in the future, as they take more, more responsibility for running our continent, their lived experience will make it easier for them. Where does that come from? If you go back and look at the leaders of the struggle, you will notice that a lot of them met at universities. What are they in Sierra Leone? Fortier in, uh, in South Africa, Makerene, and so on and so on. Now, these are people who didn't theorize. They knew, they, they would talk to each other. They had a shared lived experience. Exactly. So, see to ourselves, 
let's create a product which will attend to produce exactly that. Yeah. We then together uh, an initiative to give scholarships to African students to study on the African continent, but always outside of their own home, outside of their own country. So if you are a Zimbabwean and you get a scholarship, you can study in Zimbabwe. If you are a South African and you get a scholarship, you can study in South Africa, and so on and so on. So today we've got students in as far north as Morocco. Wow. Yeah. That we've done that's this deliberate. Young people being young people, they'll go there, they'll fall in love, they might even get married. But you know, that is lying. What what then happens is that the challenges they experience at a personal level. When they solve those, they'll solve also the continental problems. That's what we yep. Over time, we are convinced this will bear results. How many do you take in the end? Depends on how much money we can raise it. That is, as of now, we've got about 145 to wow. Yeah, that's good. So that's, that's a bit bad. That's bad stuff. That's good. Talk to me about what says about who we are as a people, as, as Zimbabweans, and why we are at this crossroad to happen as, 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 as a people. You know, what is disappointing in that clip is that President Mugabe, at that point, he, he kind of identified that we now not the pride, but we now an embarrassment. But he still found it difficult to accept responsibility as the person at the pinnacle of the leadership group. There is validity in saying I was one of a group, but he was sitting at the top of that group, and he had more leverage than anybody else. And for as long as we are not able, we see part of, we go back to the mind story. If we are not able to look at ourselves and do a critical analysis, and they take responsibility for where we are, we can't fix it. You can't fix it if it's outside of your control. And I'm sorry, I'm going to digress a little bit. It's similar to the sanctions they should. If I run this country, I would ban the word sanctions from the vocabulary of the civil service. It would not be spoken to why. Because you can't stop other people applying sanctions on you. You can't control it. So I'm not going to waste time on things I cannot control. I'll focus on the things I absolutely can control and say, let's excel at these. The rest will take care of themselves. You know, yeah, in the sense that, you know, you will hurt from people who like you and others who don't like you. I'm going to burn up energy, focus on the people who don't like you to achieve what? Here's the good thing for me about sanctions, Goshana. The things that we are supposedly being asked to do are things that are good for us. Yeah. I think that we don't need anybody to tell us they should actually do. Conduct election elections in a free and fair manner. Have uh, election laws that are speak my environment right, have yeah, accountability, yeah. don't beat up people, don't kill people and so forth. What's well, difficult to no, do? But Trevor, I suppose I'm going beyond that. I'm also saying ultimately even if you do all of those things which are right for you, you can't stop somebody you're applying funds to you anyway. True. Yeah. And if you transgress against all of those things, it doesn't follow people are going to yeah. apply sanctions on you either. So it's something, I'm just pointing out, it's something that is beyond your control. What you do for your people, for your country, should, you should do anyway, whether you get a prize for it or not. Don't, don't wait to be, to be rewarded by an outsider for doing things you should be doing. Or don't worry about whether they apply sanctions to you unjustifiably you are, you are misdirecting your head. Yeah, I, I, I think we could check that. I, I, I like the way you put it in Kuzan, because we could actually boil it down to, it's like Trevor taking a bath and walking out and expect everybody to say, oh, send a bath. I don't know if we'll see that. Yeah, I, 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 but let's talk about our, pre, our, yeah, so our president. So he, he says we are... Well, one kind of leadership with that. Well, that, well, that does not take responsibility. And he is the uh, sad you also he is only making that admission after he's been kicked out of power. Not when he was in power. Incidentally, he once said something very similar when he was still president. I don't know whether you, whether you recall. There was an occasion when somebody donated a sum of the goods from outside the country. And when the goods arrived here, the customs people started creating all sorts of impediments for things which were being yeah. given. Yeah. And you, I remember President Mugabe saying something like, I don't want the world to look at me as someone who runs a stupid system because this is not making sense. 
Intel, rather than going public, they should have just said, kind, get your act together and got it sorted out. But even then, there was almost like a behavior which said, it's beyond my control. So what I'm president of? It, it speaks in Kusana, correct me if I'm wrong. My sense, very strong sense, I'd love you to push back in. There's never been a nation building project in this country. No, there isn't. Then how, how then do we have become proud of who we are if we've not been made to feel like a nation? If we've not been led in a manner that makes us proud of who we are? If the modeling of leadership is one that says, makes you say, I'm proud of who we are. And I'm reminded by Zimbabwe, the cricket team won. And there was excitement about it. Uh, it, it says to me, we we want to be proud of who we are, but the way we are we are led it makes us question. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, this conversation can go so many many different places. <laughs> so, if you fly on the air one day, you can sense that the Wandis are proud. Why are they proud? Because of being successful. All human beings, all human beings like to associate with success. So if we would run our affairs successfully, our people would become proud of Zimbabwe. So we, you can't you can't weep people into being proud of their nation. You make them feel that there is something to be proud of, and they will be proud of their nation. But at the end, you need to have incredible clarity that that only comes out of performance. When you perform, that you, incidentally, respect by other people is similar. It will never be given to you when you are when you when you running your country. It's like it is there. I don't know what I'm doing. And I've been up, I'm on record and I'll repeat it. If I were running Zimbabwe today, I would not waste my time sending people to the UN. The IMF to the World Bank and so on and so on. It's a waste of time. You know why? 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 It's a waste of time because we've got no voice. You cannot have a voice amongst again, can I put it this way? If you are a man and let's say there is there is this sounds very chauvinistic, but yeah, hopefully you people will extract the lesson of what I'm saying. If a group of us men meet and we're having and so they excuse the chauvinistic framing, but your word your contribution's value is always, even if it's not spoken, referred to how successful your life is perceived to be. If you are coming from the streets, you are still in, under the bridge, and you come here and you're trying to tell me how to run anything, I'm not, I, I, I mean, you are you, I'll give you a seat. You, I will put it, I'll be politically correct. I'll let you speak, but it will go in one ear and come out the other. And that's what happening, what's happening with us on the global stage. Because for as long as our continent's affairs are not being run properly, I can guarantee you nobody is listening to us. Interesting that um, it appears people are listening to uh, President Kagame because he's playing a, 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 a role that's bigger than the size of Rwanda. Is that your sense? It, correct. And, and uh, before President Kagame, Remember the guy called Lee Kuan Yew? Mm. Running a, a, a city state. Lee Kuan Yew had so much boys. Be quiet because he demonstrated by how he managed Singapore. President Kagame is doing exactly the same. You can get all sorts of debates about other things like human I mean, rights, and, but nobody can deny that he's managing this country amazing the way. So Kagame is with voice more than it, it, in my humble opinion, any other sub saharan African did. He punches way above his dollars. Look at us. President Kagame today runs a country with an airline, functioning airline. Look at us. We've got more resources than President Kagame would ever have access to. What have we done with those resources? What's wrong with us? <laughs> you should. <laughs> I, Trevor, I don't know. So I don't know. Let me ask the question differently, Kosana. There is an election. Uh, in in twenty twenty three, which is next year, and I, I believe that you know it's a waste of resources because for already I'm seeing this complaints that the voters' road is not okay. Uh, we were saying you know the conditions are, are not are not are not right. What's your sense about 
be a nation's next. Okay. So Trevor, and I'm going to probably shock you, shock other people in my answer. On my journey, I stopped being too bothered about the quality of elections. If Zanuck is a party, yet national pride for me, for my country, I don't think I'll care. I don't think I'll care. I want Zan as a government governing party today to give me pride for my country. You understand? That's a good staff and problem. Yeah. Why is it there is no evidence that Zan wants to give me as a, as a citizen pride of country? That's the question for me. Why is it after our liberation struggle, we are quite, we are happy. Can I answer your question? Can I answer quite your question, Gosana? Um, and you and I have had this uh, to and fro. And I think it's essentially for me, and I, before answering question, is to say, I am like you, Gosana. I really don't help them cows and chat for as long as they, they, they make me proud. Infrastructure, electricity, yeah. water. Who's all my kid? Is you know, if, if nothing like that is happening, I'm, I'm okay with that. I don't care what was there, whether it's Nelson Chambisa, Amazon Nagabla, or whatever. And here's the thing to answer your transfer question it's because there isn't sufficient concern about the people's agenda. There isn't sufficient concern about what's good for the nation. Trevor is focused on what's good for me. I am going to be president. I'm going to make sure that those that are close to me benefit for as long as I'm still there so that they can take care of me thereafter. Sadly, Kosana, this is a conduct and a view and a way of behavior and a culture that has taken such a strong root in Zambia. And I dare say within the opposition. And which is why when people say, we need new leaders. I say, no, we don't need new leaders. We need new of us. They said a people that are able to, to, to hold to account people that be in it. And get me up a standard, because as a human being, uh, as a person, that says, I'm going to pull you to power with these people. So it's not so much the new leaders that we want, but a, a reformation of me as Trevor, or the plot of push band. You know, kind of, I mean, it's quite, kind of goes back to the mind's issue. Why Why do we need Daniels like this? We need to understand the causality. I am not surprised at all that we are where we are, because we came from a socialization which led us exactly to the way we are. We became little white people, unfortunately subjecting our own people to that experience, okay? It's understandable, that's called socialization, all right? But unless we can now sit and analyze and dissect this animal and understand how it has come to be, we cannot change it. If the cell is violent, you come from a society today, you start brutalization, and all of a sudden you see that you're brutalizing your own people, and there is not enough engagement to understand where is this phenomenon coming from? The phenomenon is coming from a collective experience which you've internalized. Yeah, but unless you really understand it, you can't change it. And I'm not even saying blame anybody. Understanding it and where it came from, causality, uh, gives you the power to deal with the change you change it. So we had to say, should we, uh, then there was, there was violence to the liberation. Do we understand what happened? Was violent. Are we to be honest about the Bible? Not to admit the answer is no. There's a violence during the world. There's a violence during elections. Have we sat down as a people and as a nation and analyzed these issues and took out some lessons out of that? Mm. And the answer is no. Yeah. And, and as a result, these things are going to continue in the AMI. Which is why I told making mistakes is not a problem. Not learning from them. Not learning from your journey. To continuously inform you how to improve is the problem. Not having the capacity and the courage to confront that and say, so what is going to draw? Let's just go back to the ideals that were articulated in way to war in the first place. Do you see any of those ideals being implemented today? Any? No, no. Do we as a nation ask ourselves what is going to draw? The answer is no. Why? Why would we not do something as simple as that? 
There is a history of what we said we're going to war for. There is a history of why we got our people killed. Why don't we now do a review to look at where we are and compare it to these ideals and say, why is it that we're not achieving this thing? Mm -hmm. It meant one would have thought, Kosana, and that what you raise is so deep. One would have thought that these are the issues that when the party to broom, when cabinet meets, people present papers on these issues so that there's analysis, analysis and traction. But also civil society, because we mustn't, uh, a civil society must not escape the, 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 the focus. And civil society should be bringing up pressure on these issues. Sure. This is what the war was about, what has been done. Anyway. No, no, we are not sure on that. Let, let me go back to something we, we discussed before we came here formally. You talk to me about naysayers and, and a section. You know, no, 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 no. Don't consider them as naysayers. Consider them as people who push back and give you the opportunity to refine. Sure. That whole uh, way of behavior is something that we should not take for granted. It's something that is cultivated in a society. The ability to put your own views on the table, even if they are different from mine, but do it, it with respect. And for me also to welcome you saying, Gosana, I disagree, yeah? And when we come to books, and I think it's a book I've referred to you to be before, Colin Power, it's a very powerful, you know, this attitude of being able, when we are debating something, understanding that the debate is not about Cheva, it's not about Gosana, it's about the views you put on the big table. And allowing everybody to have a say and give their own view but also having the discipline that once you've gone through that process and we now agree on the way forward, all of us, even those who didn't agree, now understand, if you understand collective responsibility, we have now fleshed this, thrashed this out and we've now agreed this is where we go. So now let's get on with it. But we don't do it. it they have all this discipline yeah. of being able to listen to people who don't agree with you and understand the value in their disagreement with you and you respect them for not agreeing with you and not be threatened by it. Take it as improving the quality of the decisions you're now going to make. It's a cultural thing. It's a culture we need to cultivate. Question to you is as we're talking about the culture where you have you tolerate uh you give people the time to place their ideas on the table, fully able to look at the ideas and criticize them and improve them and so forth. Then my question is why is the role of the leadership in creating that culture? Because we don't have that culture in Zimbabwe right now. For me it's an agent thing on the part of the citizens and the leadership. What role do leaders have to? You know, trouble. So the role implies in many ways a active structuring or creating. But I think the starting point is a personality issue. Am I confident in myself as a person to be able to take pushback or ideas and be confident that I'll listen carefully and be able to say, yes, I hear that and yes, that makes sense. And I said that my own original thought can be defined by listening, or am I confident enough that if in fact there's nobody did in the pushback, I can explain why. So the first thing is a personality issue and level of confidence to be able to listen actively but genuinely. Secondly, an appreciation that when you are in a hierarchy, it does not matter whether it's public or private state. A hierarchy creates a dynamic where those who are subordinate are more cautious until given permission, not only verbally, by the way. People who look at non-verbal communication as well. Am I only saying so in words, but actually say, what child? <laughs> okay. So they will, be, they will actually value much more the non-verbal communication if we can reinforce it that I'm genuinely saying, I able genuinely. You're free to speak. Free to speak, 
And especially in rules that are very clear. Remember what I said about common power. Our culture is going to be, you've got a responsibility. There is permission, responsibility, expectation for you to tell us what you think. Provided there is also an understanding that once we've done all of this and they concluded and taken a decision, even those who were opposed to this position are now responsible for the implementation. Why should that be important? It's a, it's a rule book issue. If I know that I will win sometimes and I'll lose it other times, it gives me comfort that actually it doesn't matter because it's for the good of the whole world. It's not personal. That's how the dynamic works. And if we let the world would say, if 51% of us decide in this direction, all of us will implement. Today I'll be in the 51, tomorrow I'll be in the 49. As long as there is consistency in the implementation of that practice, it will be fine. The fight. It will be fine. Yes. Gosana, you, when you were last here, um, I asked you a question and I want us to play a video now of the question I asked you about, you know, where do we go from here as a, as a country? Um, so let's play the video and then I'll ask you a question. So how do we get there? I think either the population will rebel and force the ruling elite, the ruling uh, organization to change course, mm. or as I interpret what Thabo Mbeki was trying to do, I think Thabo Mbeki was trying to get ZANU itself, which is a ruling party, which has been a ruling, the ruling party since independence, to reform within itself. So if ZANU, for instance, were to understand my, my uh, uh, analogy of running a relay, that would be the quickest way to get a continuity which is not psychologically challenging to the nation, mm -hmm. to literally adjust to different phases. We fought a war, we're done with that. Now we're in the rebuilding phase. Mm -hmm. We have to choose with that, almost like transform ZANU and make it fit for purpose for the different phases of the journey. Mm -hmm. That would be the quickest way. The way it's going at the moment, I think it's going to be disrupted because the, the suffering in the country will at some point say enough is enough. Yeah? Which is sad because the, the discontinuities and the uh, traumas that come with that will create their own issues. Right, so you, you, you say it, it's one of two things is going to happen um, in that video that, you know, Zanu PF might be reformed or the people might rise up. Whereas you see now, have we, have we changed that view or you still hold that to that view, your assessment of where the country is right now? My sense is that the people seem to be somewhat, particularly the young people, we spoke about the young people. In terms of the campaign to register to vote, they're not coming up in numbers. There's a lot of reasons that have been ex explained there. Are you, which one do you think is going to happen? Is Zanapi have got to be reformed? They've just come out of a police debrief. And by the people, have the people suffered enough? Then they might rise up. Where do you see it? I think that Shani is still, still the same. Okay. What I will say, though, to respond to your observation is that, true, there are no indications at the moment that Zanot is paying attention to reforming itself. But the fact that young people are not necessarily registering what does not mean they won't rebel. It's simply a question of how will they rebel. If their conditions continue to be what they are, it can only lead to one outcome, a rebellion of some kind. But it can be forestalled if observed in their own. It's not really important needs run in big countries. So, and the learning needs to understand this. People are not against Zan. People are against how Zan is running the country. If Zan will reforms itself and runs the country properly, in many ways, opposition will die yeah. as there won't be any need. Somebody says that, Kosana, uh, to, to this point, that a lot of people, if you ask them who is the president of Switzerland, nobody, can, nobody knows. Actually. Nobody cares or nobody knows. Living in Switzerland. Yeah. Why? Yeah. It's Switzerland work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so one would have, if, if you then extend that logic um, and say, if Zan PF did everything that, or would rather did their best to ensure that the majority of the people are happy, and Zan PF would worry about we thought to talk, can we reframe this? Again, I, I know I've mentioned this many, many times as an observation, sadly. 
most developing countries have not understood the concept that when they, let's say they get into power genuinely, from that point, they present a program as a part, okay? But once they get into power, what they need to understand, they need to run a country for the people, all of the people, because that way they will get even more and more support. But if you will notice that Zion, amongst other third world countries, they think once they get into power, they must run the country for Zion. Big mistake. Big, big mistake. I, and I, again, it's not rocket science, and I just don't understand why. You get into, into the presidency, run the country for all of the people, and you, you, your support will increase. But they start punishing people who didn't vote for it. The way to, to, to do this is to convert those who didn't vote for you through what you do. So that next time around, they say, this person is delivered. Why would I vote for somebody else? I know I'm going to put my vote behind them. That is the thinking that should be there, but it is not, sadly. You go around beating up people. No, no, don't beat them up. Show them through your action of running the country for them that they are included in this polity. And your support will increase. You imprison people that job seeker. Yeah. I don't know for how many. What for? Yeah. But it is it's just, you know, when you go back to an observation you made. We have not yet started on the journey of great building nations. I don't think that we even understand what it is. I don't think we do. Now, Gosana, I know you you uh, you don't want to focus on yourself, but for me, one reason why we are having you here for the second time is but I really genuinely believe that you have done you've given quite a lot to this nation if and and the continent, and you continue to and have, um, you you you're planting a seed. As far as minds is concerned, that's going to let me know after you are gone. I'm reminded of uh, um, uh, the wine producer out in Cape Town that I visited and said, you know, the the, the crop that we are harvesting, my father uh, planted it uh, what, 40 years ago. He's gone now, but the kids are there to to to, to enjoy the wine and, and prosper from that. You have done uh, amazing things. And I'm reminded, um, you know, Benjamin Franklin, read quite a lot about uh, at some point when I was 42 you are 72 71 great right? even Franklin had built this uh, uh, good business so for the decided pruning and his mother said to him why, why are you doing that and Benjamin Franklin said I would rather have it said he lived you squid rather that he died rich what epitaph would you want us to put on the tombstone Trevor, I think the honest truth is that I actually don't don't invest any energy in thinking what I would like to do most. And that's just the, the truth. I live my life. I'm trying to create, a, to contribute, to contribute. I'm trying to to contribute to creating a society that is function. A society that my kids and my grandchildren can belong to with pride. For me, that is enough. That's all I'm trying to Contribute towards creating something we can all look at and say, I am proud to be part of this. That's all it is. That's all beautiful. As you're talking, my heart actually is, is, is pumping beautifully. And let me uh, point uh, our viewers out there to this amazing book, which is Creating the Good Life and Creating the Good Society. Yeah. And I'm going to put you on a uh, point uh, on the, on the uh, sport here, Kosana. You young people that are watching right now and they'll be asking the question this man has done so much um uh been creating um, a society that his kids are going to leave it what what should young people be doing to contribute to their societies in a meaningful way you know it's it's again for young people it's it's it, the answer often i think is can appear to be going against what young people want to do. So I've got a number of uh, observations of night. Sure, absolutely. When you are young, you are energetic, true. You are innovative, more innovative often than older people, true. But you know, if I look at my parents, it's also true that living life, just living life, gives you insights into 
life itself that you don't get until you've lived life. Okay. So I think the trick we are missing often when we have the debate about old and young is that actually life is structured this way for a reason. Our challenge is an end, end, not an end. Mm -hmm. Our challenge is how do we tap into these attributes, which you cannot debate that young people have got more than we have. But at the same time, that young people understand that there are certain things until they've lived life that they don't have. So I think what nature invites us to do is to find a way to relationship. Not, it's not an either ball. As you get all they don't have the energy. You've got the experience and hopefully, hopefully wisdom, you don't have the energy now. Yeah. You be you don't your your natural instincts. You don't have the time, you don't have the energy. Yeah. And your natural instincts are not yet towards trying the untested. When you are younger, it's much more in your DNA. And the key therefore has to be how do we get this two to combine so that we can continue to push the boundaries to find out what we don't know yet comes from the young. And then for all the people to say, you know what, I've seen this play before. Let's avoid this and this and the other without stopping the pushing against boundaries. It's an end game. It's not in a hole. And it's a beautiful uh, equilibrium. And I know you <laughs> have out of that space. The, the other thing uh, before we go on to books around, you know, a lot of people might not be aware of is that you had pilot and uh, born in Berengwa. Um, talk to me about what it is that made you decide you want to get a, a commission, a commission, a pilot's license, a pilot's license. A commission, a pilot's license. Why, with this young boy from Berengwa, uh, why does he want to fly? You know, Trevor, again, when we ask questions like this, often the way we answer them is a rationalization. You know, post facto, you rationalize. I think the truth is probably that I don't know. You know. I, I think there was an opportunity. When I was at university, there was a facility. I was, I, I'm a curious person anyway. And uh, I took to flying and I, I started off as a glider pilot. Got to a bronze sea in gliding. Then came back here and worked in Charles Prince and got myself a power flying license. I enjoy flying, piloting. So do you still have your license? No, in what I thought I have not made the document. Not in there. Yeah, yeah. Your time, pressures of time, flying takes quite a bit off. Gosep, talk to me about, um, if you, if, has there been a hill that stood in front of you that you failed to climb? that humbled you? What is the one thing in life that has humbled you? What is that hill that has stood before you and you wanted to climb then you never been able to climb? Creating unlimited time for doing all this. <laughs> <laughs> for all the things I'd like. Yeah. Suppose at this age, that, that's the thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And this is a message to you. Yeah. Like you said, you know, that um, uh, when you're young, be adventurous. Don't waste your time. Because when you get to this age, you suddenly to realize that at most I have 29 years or 10 years. But when you're 40, you know. That's Trevor. In this answer, you know, I, I'm thinking as I respond to you and I'm saying that is there a lesson also in this observation? And I suspect there may be. Is it like reading books? There are countless uh, materials out there for you to read. Maybe the challenge is not so much to read all of them, which is an impossibility, or as many of them as possible. Maybe similarly, the challenge is not to do everything under the sun. But maybe encapsulated in everything we do, actually, are all the other things we could have done. If, if you get my case. Yes, I do. So if that were to be the case, let's, let's understand that it is the impossible to do everything there is to go under the sun. But that encapsulated in everything we do are all of the other things we could have done, provided, however, we do it to the best of our ability. You understand? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes, I do. We, we too, also, as we were talking before we came here, I said, my frustration, because I'm in this but myself, I'm 60 now. Have I done it? You see, enough is probably the wrong adjective. Adverb, adjective, whatever. If I, if I done what I've done, 
well enough. It's a different phrasing. And I think it's a more appropriate phrase. That makes me comfortable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> have I done what I've done well enough? Not have I done enough, because that means a multiplicity of things. Whereas if I challenge myself, if I'm a commercial pilot, and I make sure that I do my flying to the best of my ability, have I done what I've done well enough? Let's get into books now. You want to get your wiles, your iPad. Well, I can talk to the new one, or the test one is we all the, 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 the couple of books that you've, you suggested last time were very popular with people, so I'm looking forward to. So I did talk about Colin Powell and Shivan Master last time. So I'll add two more. And to, just to contextualize, why are these books meaning something to me at this point in time? This whole conversation we're having about society. How do you create a soul? What is a society? In many ways, that has led me to find these particular books very meaningful. A society that where you accept handing the pattern on, in other words, it's not about you. It's about the task for the society. And accept that your own contribution is by force going to be per force limited. Your responsibility is to do your bit and they hand over to the next runner the button for them to do their bit. It's, it's, it's the sort of occupying. So there is a book here, The World We Are In. The, uh, the, this is by uh, Will H uh, Hutton. Okay. Very specifically, Will Hutton is analyzing the UK versus the US versus Europe. And he's arguing that the UK is making a mistake in trying to model itself after the Americas, as opposed to after Europe. He is adding that its DNA, in terms of where their societies come from, is more European than America. The foundations are European, not Yeah, That's essentially the argument he's making. But that talks to, when you write a society, whenever you come and know when you are administering a society, how important is it for you to understand in general your society has been on? Where is your society actually come? What are the foundations, the foundations of your society on which you are now building? Can we just continue to build without understanding what these foundations are? I think this is, this is, this is it's an important question because, because you, you, you then either going to build on a fault foundation or you won't have yeah, stuff that's going to propel you yeah. on, on a strong foundation. Yeah, exactly. Very well. We found this will be appropriate for what you tried to do. Yeah. We go back to mine. And then the issue of us, what is our foundation? Are we building on it or on some other? Oh, we see. It's a, and I think part of why we struggle in so much is because we're trying to build what a foundation that is not true to who we are. So we are not making it. We're not getting touched now. Well, we don't get in touch. The second problem, yeah. This uh, book is the first risk. The first risk illustrates something by a lot by, uh, by Michael Lewis. Okay. Uh, Michael Lewis uh, is a, an, an American diplomat, actually. So the Thai diplomat. And he's talking about American diplomacy, a lot of it to do with the Trump administration's takeover. But what is very instructive for me as you read this book, is the structures that America as a society, we back to the society, as a society, is put into its structures as much as possible encouragement, incentives for one administration to understand they are running a relay. They are not the warriors. They will inevitably hand over to another administration. It could be from their own party, it could be from another party, that whole handover period, it's fascinating, fascinating because, to watch. It was needed about America, mm. not about the person who became yeah. No, no, no. It's about America and you've got a responsibility to tell whoever is coming in, give them an opportunity to understand where you've got to. Where have I taken this baton? 
Begin of runway is it taken me? On behalf of this society. society. Can I, if you sufficiently for you to understand, you don't have to agree with me, but understand where I've come from to get to here as I hand it over. So that we win. It's a society. We maintain the momentum. Yes. Wow. Gosan. It's always a pleasure talking to you, Gosana. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thought provoking, refreshing ideas. Um, and I always enjoy talking to you, Gosana. But it is a thing, Gosana. Um, which you, you don't have to say that. Yeah. Don't ask, I don't respond. You are, to me, the leader that Zimbabwe needs right now. You embody the values of, I am smaller than the nation, but I can contribute to the nation. It's not about me. I'm here to play my role and move on. And I admire that a lot. You don't have to respond. Thanks, and <laughs> Thanks, Ngosana. Let me turn to our viewers, Ngosana, who watch us um, uh, every week on Monday on YouTube at uh, 7 a.m. Central African time. Thank you so much uh, for your support. Um, remember to subscribe, uh, to like, and to share. And also go to our podcast. We've created post podcasts for you, which sit on our website, uh, convowithtrevor.com. Click there for your listening pleasure. We, the team, looks at all the comments that you make, the suggestions that you make, uh, and we value uh, the suggestions, the criticism that we make, and we try to get back to uh, all of you. So until next time, thank you for watching, and cheers to you. Uh...